uh, one and all. Uh, and a special welcome to uh, Robert Gilman, who's, who's with me. We'll give you a, a minute or two to introduce yourself, brother, because uh, we're not due to start quite yet. Okay. As, as uh, yeah. we've been saying, good morning, Karen. Good to have you with us, sister. Um, as, as we say, we've got our identity sorted out by our backgrounds. I've got the wild woods behind me and you've got your books, which make you look very academic, which is appropriate because you are still uh, involved in academic study at the moment, aren't you? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Good morning, so Bronwyn. You want, me, you want me to introduce yeah, myself? Tell us a little now? about yourself, brother. Introduce yourself to the online community. Okay. See, so um, I started as an atheist a long time ago, and um, then I got into, became a believer during university and went to missions in the 20s, when I was in the 20s. And recently, in the last 10 years or so, I've got into Bible translation. Uh, so so I, in I'm, the last 10 years you've been doing Bible translation? On and off, um, mostly in Bangladesh. And uh, I've been working from the academic level, uh, uh, training the students in Greek, and uh, and also I'm an IT specialist. So I've been setting up the fixing their computer networks up there as well. Um, so I work. In, I'm, in, I'm a computer in programmer. Bangladesh. Yeah, so I'm a computer programmer full time, but I I take my uh, annual leave in Bangladesh quite regularly, and. Um, and so I help out, uh, and I'm right now I'm doing the Bachelor of Theology to um, become one of those people called a translation consultant. Because uh, whenever a translation is done, they, the Bible Society needs someone with certain academic levels to stamp it as being accurate to, for publishing. So I'm doing currently run, doing the Bachelor of Theology part time. To um, okay, to uh, so it's taking a while to to. All in, the, all in the future to becoming a qualified translation consultant. Yeah. So, so, so right now, when I do translation work, um, it still has to go through a consultant finally before it, um, it hits the hits the publisher. And, but they have to do far less because I've done most of the work with the um, the checking of the the translations. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what drew you to Bangladesh, brother. Well, I mean, I'm obviously I'm connected with the missions uh, in, community in, in Queensland up here, and uh, okay. through that, um, my I was asked to come on board with a project in Bangladesh. Um, so I wasn't dr <coughs> dr drawn to public. I was asked to come in and help out in Bangladesh. So that's why I went to ba Bangladesh to help out. Okay, so you'd never been there before, but you were connected with the Bangladeshi community where you are in Queensland. I know, I'm I'm connected with the mission community because I'm an ex missionary, and I I speak uh, Hindi and Urdu because uh, we used to, we lived in uh, India for a couple of few years, and uh, so we're fairly fluent in Indian languages, um, wow. which has helped out in Bangladesh. Hmm. Okay, well, what's the language there? In Bangladesh, Bangladeshi. is Bangla, yeah. which is very similar to Hindi, which is the language I'm, I'm, I'm fluent in. Well, when I say I'm fluent in, when I get to India, I can speak it fluently. But when I'm in Australia, I can't think of it at all because it goes to the back of your mind. <laughs> and it's just amazing. It's the context. It's the context where you where you are, which allows you to um, speak the language. Gotcha. Mm. Gotcha. I know uh, Scotty's just come to join me. Oh, good. Good timing, brother. We're already live online. We're about to start our our Eucharist. You're going to use the bathroom. <laughs> I have some company out here in the bush, and we've got five okay. others with us now online. As I say, good morning, uh, Karen, Bronwyn, and Pia, and uh, to the others who are with us. I, I must... Um, mention that um, while I'm hopeful of having Walter join us this morning, uh, he's not at all well. Oh. And, um, yeah, yeah, you've met Walter 
Robert Havenshire and oh, um, right. yeah. Yeah. he's a great guy and my yeah. best friend and um, I had a call from uh, the Marion Centre where the, where he stays and I, I was connected with him yesterday through a you know FaceTime mm -hmm. uh, sort of th they're very concerned about him oh, yeah, just, um, so I'm just yeah. praying that he's going to get through this and be back with us if not today by next week and be all the stronger for it mm -hmm. but um uh prayers mm -hmm. for walter today i also mm -hmm. had a, a text this morning from mark taylor who's part of our online community and he likewise was asking for uh prayer i'm just going to look for the message he's here. not cricketer is he <laughs> sorry mark taylor is He's not no, the cricketer. Not, not that one, I think. This is a, another um, former priest, I think, who um, okay. says he's very sick and in a lot of pain. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of it going about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of pain in the world at the moment. Yeah. Mm. Everyone who thirsts comes to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him. While he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. It goes to 10, doesn't it? Thanks, Peter God. Thanks, Peter God. Do you want to offer us some thoughts on that passage from Isaiah? It's a powerful one. It is. So verse 2 struck me quite uh, strongly when I, when I was reading through this. Why do you spend money, your money, for that which is not bread and your labour for that which does not satisfy. It seems to me that what it, what Isaiah is saying is, why are you wasting your life's efforts on building up <coughs> possessions uh, when those possessions do nothing for you? The only thing that actually does stuff for you is food, food and drink. Um, so it seems like he's talking about the, but even back in those days, they had a very uh, commercialist way of living in which they would gather possessions by, uh, and be happy with keeping on gathering and gathering possessions when, when what people should be doing is according to the verse three is inclining our ear to the Lord. And only only doing the work that is necessary to satisfy our daily living, rather than to uh, rather than to, to gather possessions like the rich man in Jesus talks about, who gathers all his stuff in the silos and and thinks back on how wonderful er everything he has because he's got all these silos full of uh, um, full of wheat and stuff like that. And Jesus says, "Well, tonight." He will lose everything. Um, so, yes. So this this stuff is all connected through how G Jesus has the same 
idea as Isaiah is portraying here that you know, our life is meant to be a dedication with to God, a creation to God. I believe the Westminster Confession says something like glory to glorify God is our purpose. And this has resonance in these verses. We need to have our priorities uh, that our labor is just for uh, providing the food and the shelter that we need. Um, It's not to consume us. What we, we are to be consumed in living, inclining our ears to God. Uh, I believe, I remember when in my early 20s, I, I, I had the saying, live simply so all may simply live. Yes. And um, as I get older, I become less and less like I was in the 20s and more and more uh, the person I, 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 I was preaching against. In the twenties, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I used to have what? that same with simply sticker on my bag, and yeah, uh, yeah that the progress of time, things get less and less simple, don't they? That's right. But uh, yep. of course, I've had the blessing in the last couple of years to be reduced back to simplicity. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've yeah. gone from living in a great big house with multiple bedrooms to just being in a tiny renting a tiny flat for myself and my daughter and um, most of those possessions have gone the way of all flesh so it's been a in some ways an edifying experience but I imagine it wasn't taken that way initially it was difficult to come to terms with initially yes yeah. but um, yeah. I, in all truth I do appreciate the greater simplicity uh, you know yeah. we just need our daily bread don't we really that's right I, I remember thinking yeah. I should always be ready to move and go wherever God opens the doors. And this is one of the uh, missionary ideas I certainly had strongly in the 20s. And so I should uh, have just enough inf- uh, possessions that I don't have to spend six months uh, de- decluttering my life so I can go and do whatever God tells me to do wherever I need to be for God. And... um I believe I've gone way off the track. <laughs> in the last 20, 30 you've, you've reminded years. me very much of my friend Father Elias, who who would yeah. be joining us, I think, except that he's in the Netherlands and the time zones are prohibitive. Yeah. But um, I, I remember so many years ago when Elias, we were just in contact through our community message board, mm-hmm. and um, he's he's a monk with the Order of the Community of Saint John, yeah. and. Uh, he was working with kids in Lithuania at the time, I think, um, yep. teaching them to yep. box, but he didn't really know how to box. And he said, oh, is there somewhere out here I can learn how to do this? Right. And I said, no, you'll have to come over here. And then, yep. you know, next thing he contacts me and says, okay, I've spoken to my superior. I'm on my way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A week or two later, I'm meeting him at the airport. He says, just as long as I've got a room to stay in, I can support myself. And, yeah. The point being that he had no no mortgage, no house, no um, children to look after, no, nothing to tie him. Yeah. He yeah. had everything in his backpack and he arrived mm. and then it was the best part of two years later that he was got a call and had to up and leave again. But, you know, it made him like a commando that he was just mm. able to be shifted wherever he was needed. You know, mm. wonderful man. So yeah. much to offer, a great preacher, academic. and um, But the point was, yeah, exactly as you say, his simplicity mm. allowed him to uh, move uh, mm. at a moment's notice and to be uh, mm. deployed uh, where he was yeah. most needed. Yeah, so I, I believe when we read the Scriptures, we need to look at how we're to enact what the Scriptures uh, say to us. Yeah, it, it, for, while, I, while I'm deep, deep in academia, I, I feel uh, in academia there's a lack of um, a lack of application theology. This could be could be the word, and uh, and uh, I feel when we read the scriptures, we need to work out together how we are to become like how the scripture um, go, leads us to. 
application. Oh, you just, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think I get it. Uh, yeah, so not, not all just I'm saying is, and away from it. Yeah, r rather than saying what tense this verb is and, and that type of stuff, yeah, yeah. We, 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 need, we need to think, how are we going to do this? Yeah, these, yeah. this is, we have nothing to tell us how to live other than the words of God that we can be sure of so 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 how yeah. to live is a, is a big question with reading scriptures is what i'm trying what i'm saying here yeah yeah I, I'm, I'm interested too thinking of the context we we're looking in in isaiah 55 here isaiah is yeah. still addressing a people in exile isn't he so i, yeah, I would I have thought so. that those people were not doing great no no <laughs> The vast majority of them, at any rate, I imagine, are still struggling. Yeah. Yeah, so perhaps, the context matters, looking, doesn't it? Yeah, well, perhaps he's looking forward and, you know, saying, you know, as things improve, remember the real things that satisfy. Yeah. Could be. Could be. Mm. All right, we'll, we'll move on to the second reading. Right. Uh, we, we were hoping to have Doug with us to give us a second reading, but... Unfortunately, he's not here unless Scotty wants to jump in, and I'm assuming you don't. I'm correct. <laughs> I'll give I'll give the second reading here from 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples for us so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did. And they were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example. They are written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing... He will also provide you the way out so that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Not everybody's favourite passage from St Paul, I think, Robert. No. <laughs> no. no. I mean, if we think of all the, the well-known passages of Paul, this is not one of them. No. <laughs> and for Why I didn't choose it to talk about <laughs> Sorry? It's why I didn't choose it to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I can see that. I mean, it begins, interestingly, with, with Paul looking back. Well, the context is Paul looking back on the history of the people of Israel, and it's all, you know, it, it feels a bit like how those past memories sort of all merge into the present somehow. It's all, But it's all connected spiritually, as he mm. sees. It's not just that sort of their history is our history, but, you know, our history and Christ in our history was part of their history. Mm. You know, mm. that rock they had back there in the desert, that was Christ. You mm. know, the um, that experience they had going through the sea, that was their baptism and in the cloud. You know, the, mm. th there's connections everywhere mm. that Paul everywhere. sees that we yeah. otherwise, I think, would not see. Yeah. And, um, mm. you know, we, we'd want to respect the historical distance and the context for Paul now, it all seems to be merging into one, the presence and the past and the future. And the, the point being that Christ is in all of it. Mm. 
So, you know, yes. as Christ is for every, everything in the present for us and will be in the future, so in the past we find Christ there as well. Hmm. Well, it's a, it's a, I mean, we're humans and Christ is God. So for all the history, um, uh, humans have related to God and God's related to humans. So all that historical stuff, is about how God has related to us and we've related to God. So which connects right now to right now and to when Paul was speaking. Yeah, and I think this this faith perspective where you see Christ in everything um, is powerful. I think of some of my Indigenous friends who've, who've spoken from their own spiritual traditions and see Christ in that. You know, Christ was talking to us in this way you know that in their own dream time myths that to, to see the presence of christ uh, somehow in that you know i think we you know you've, you've got a missionary background that i know the um perspective often their missions is is we need to bring christ in to um uh, communities that have, haven't been exposed to the christian gospel but mm. uh Perhaps it's important to see that, you know, in as much as the Christian gospel in itself might not have arrived, God has been there. God is, yeah. These are still God's people and God's yeah. children, and it's hard to doubt that God hasn't been working with them and communicating with them in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what your perspective on that is, Robert. Yeah, so we uh, went to, when we lived in northern India, we, we w used the idea of going into the the man of peace in the area, in a big Muslim suburb, and we got to know the family, the major family of that thing, of that area. And we just spent time with them. And whatever the opportunity was to share about Christ, to talk about Christ, we did. Now, you know, what we did was fairly lame and fairly, it didn't look like we achieved much during our time there. And, but, we went back 12 years later and visited them. And they had gospels everywhere, all over their walls, all written in Urdu. God had done heaps of work. I mean, what we did was paltry and, and really uh, quite weak. <laughs> but, yeah, God had done what he had done, even though we, what we did was, yeah, what to, to what we felt was, was very, very insipid. Um, and God was there doing his stuff with them and you know, sort of using us as just a uh, a, a, a trigger, I mean, a starting point to get the whole thing happening. And God was doing the stuff, you know what I mean? We were just uh, the vessels. Yeah, so God was there before you got there. God and worked through you when you got there and God continued and we, to work after you left. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so God was doing all that stuff and uh, he, he used us because uh, that's what he likes to do. Um, but uh, he work, was working through other ways to get to get that community to Christ in, in northern India. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. So we sang Amazing Grace yeah. with them uh, in, in their community. This is a Muslim community largely in northern India when we went back the second time. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. All right, I'm going to remove you for a second, Rob, and we're going to stand for the gospel. Okay. Where's my gospel? Lost a piece of paper. Is that it? No, nope. never mind. I can see the verses there. The Holy Gospel is written at the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. At that time, there were some present who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, 
Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? <clears throat> he replied, <clears throat> pardon me. He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, yet if not, you can cut it down. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to bring Robert back in. I said that uh, the reading from St. Paul wasn't our favourite Pauline reading. This is not, certainly not <laughs> one of our favourite gospel readings, is it? It's, it's, uh, it's a painful and difficult one. <sighs> initial, initial impressions, I mean, I mean, it starts with the disciples raising these issues about the tragedies that they see going on around them. The mm. uh, incident with Pilate mixing the blood with the sacrifices sounds particularly terrible mm. uh, and confronting for people of faith to think that uh, Roman troops might have come in and killed people at prayer. Mm. You know, it just seems... Surely God would protect that people in that context. Well, so uh, for me, yeah, go on. Uh, for me, uh, this strikes at the heart of a lot, a lot of people's idea of the control, God, God controlling everything. Um, for, that, that this stuff happened, as you just said, surely God would have done something to stop this. Right, um, but I think that's a. Well, Jesus is highlighting the fact that uh, that we expect God to come in and take control when evil's about. Uh, and when evil happens, we get upset. Uh, and and God's God's Jesus is saying here that uh, no, that's the wrong view, basically of. of of the way to look at how God deals with humanity. Um, these people were not ungodly, were not bad people. These are just people like you and I, but stuff happens, you know, in, in the life as it is. Uh, yes, I mean, what, we, what we're dealing with here is just confronting them, I think, what's the most fundamental religious intuition. Yeah. I mean, if you're familiar with, the writings of Manuel Kant, you remember he he's Kant said it, it would put it as the, the basic spiritual intuition that we all have that good should be rewarded and evil punished. Yes. You know, it's it's the fundamental moral intuition that all of humanity mm. shares, perhaps apart mm. from sociopaths. We we mm. all recognize that good should be rewarded and evil punished. And mm there's a feeling that God should be making sure that that process works appropriately. And it doesn't. No, it doesn't. So, but, you know, we I ask the question, book. why? I mean, the book of Job's devoted to that question as well, of course, why? Yeah. Um, surely, you know, the concept of karma, that good things will come back on good people and bad things, you know, surely it should work out that way. I mean, Kant used to say this is the, uh, spiritual intuition of eternity you know yeah. that uh, there has yeah. to be a just recompense at, at, at some point yeah. but um you know look i find even you know having you go to the bedside of people at hospital who've been devout yeah. spiritual people all their all their lives and they will still yeah. be asking why is this happening to me you know am i being punished mm. 
you know, the, the yeah. connection between doing good and being rewarded and yeah. being, if you're suffering, it must be because you did something wrong. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a deep connection in us, I think, psychologically, yeah. spiritually. I think it's a misunderstanding also of God, our relation to God's relation to humanity. I mean, there's lots of, there's a book I remember reading called Life is Not Fair. Um, I think what we need to understand is God's, what God wants is simply like, like in the, in the passage of Isaiah 55, that we incline our ear to him. That's, that's what God wants. And that's what he's going for. All this stuff happens uh, is just part of life. God's not a control freak is what I, I, I often say. Okay. God, uh, God is not here to control everything that happens. This this is just my personal uh, theology, which may be wrong. Okay. I, I'm quite happy to be told I'm wrong. But I, I, I don't believe God is a control freak. I believe God... God's concern right throughout reading the scriptures is that we should know him and we should love him. But he's not a control freak. But, but surely God does intervene. I mean, that's why we pray, isn't it? Because, you know, when we're praying for ourselves and other people, as I'm going to be praying for my friends Mark and Walter today, I'm believing that, that you know, God can intervene and change things uh, yes. and see that justice is done and that, Good people. Yeah, that, help. That, that's it. Yeah. So that's our job. It's, our job is to pray. So, so yes, our job is to pray that God will do something. Uh, and so, yes, and God does intervene, but with us in tow. You know what I mean? God, God wants us to speak to Him, and be with Him. That's my my ideas, anyway. So, so yes, no, prayer is I, amazing. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you're 100 percent right. And the the great danger of um, losing sight of this is um, scapegoating. Yeah, you know, if something's gone wrong, it's it's you know, God is just, so it must be somebody else's fault. Um, I, I remember years ago, I was in the Philippines. And uh, I'm meeting, it always stuck with me, this meeting I had with the Anglican priest there, who said he found it very difficult. He was a French Frenchman. And mm. uh, he said he found it very difficult in that culture and context to preach the cross. Mm. And he, he gave an illustration. He said, um, I mean, I was there at a time when things were very violent, just after mm. the overthrow of the Marcos regime. And... Mm. Um, uh, he told me that he'd been in a bus one morning and, you know, people were just reading their papers and things and then the bus pulled up because there were a number of dead bodies on the, the sidewalk and, and uh, people who'd been killed by machine gun fire and yeah. it was gruesome. Mm. And uh, he said people looked down from their papers, looked out at the bodies and said they must have done something really bad. Yeah. And then they yes. went back to reading their papers. <laughs> that was the illustration. Because that's how people deal with it. That's how you cope with it. You know, you say, that obviously can't happen to me because, you know, I'm, I'm not a bad person. You know, that, that, won't, that won't happen to me. Yeah. You know, and this so is why. Geez. Yeah, go on. Well, this is why when you, you find someone's been killed at prayer, like uh, the example <laughs> the disciples raise, their blood yeah. was mingled with their sacrifices. That's yeah. deeply confronting, you know. Surely they're good, pious people, just like me. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that can't happen to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I see this in the coverage of the tragedy in Ukraine at the moment, people yeah. letting slip lines like they don't exactly say these are white people like me, but they say, oh, they drive cars like us and they, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's this feeling of identity for right. a lot of uh Australian and European people that makes them feel very insecure. As long as the mm. people look different from us and they seem to be black with a different a different colour, skin colour, different religion, a long way away, you know, well, you know, that happens to them. It doesn't happen to us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it becomes confronting when it's a person who looks like you or it's a person at prayer just where you were praying last week 
and oh my god these things could happen to me mm -hmm. you know it's it's very we want to be more secure than that surely god's looking after me nothing's going to go wrong for me or my children mm -hmm. and what's jesus response to that yeah. you know um it's it's not reassurance is it no he says well you know he says watch yourself mm. yeah. ne next time may fall on you that's right <laughs> Or life happens. You know, it's, it's, Go on. Sorry. So, so life happens, and uh, it's not about what, how pious we are. It's the the w whether things happen badly or not is not the issue. Our issue is what we do with this minute. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it's not it's not our our issue is to judge what happened over there. It's our issue is always what we are doing now. I mean, this is the reality. Yes, bad things happen to good people. That's right. That is the reality. Mm. And um, it's interesting, both in the epistle reading we had from St. Paul and here in the Gospel, mm -hmm. when you see these things happen, mm. don't look for explanations. Yeah. Let them be for you a sobering reminder of mm. the fragility of life exactly ne the, yeah. next, the next tower could be falling in your direction it could fall on you make the most of the time you've got yes it's all about the present yes yeah mm. yeah mm. yeah i mean it's important isn't it, to be you know maybe we get too smug Yep. We forget that life is fragile. Yeah, I think it's and a it's a so. it's a yeah, certainly as being a missionary in India and, and Bangladesh, you see people living on the edge all the time. They're living hand right. to mouth. And that's that was actually the biggest challenge of being a missionary for me was um living in these countries where I see people living hand to mouth and telling them about Christ because these people depended each day on you know, what, what was around them, that they could get enough food to feed their family. And so I, rem I remember seeing a, a father with a kid on his back walking up and down tra train lines, picking rice granules off the ground to feed his family. And, and uh, this this type of stuff, we, we need... West, basically, we've become comfortable and so we're not acting as though as as life matters. You know what I mean? Yeah, so I guess the message of the gospel today is don't get too comfortable. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. That that's a negative way of putting it. I mean the positive way of, be, of putting it would be recognize that life is fragile and uh, take every moment, every day, every hour and every minute as a gift. Make the yes. most of it. Pretty much. Yeah. And that concludes our liturgy today. I'm going to bring our brother Robert back in. Thank you so much for sharing the time with us today, brother, and for sharing your wisdom on the scriptures. No what what lays ahead of you today now? More study? Yeah, I'm writing on the 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 Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. Tom. All the different ideas about what it what it actually is uh, yeah transubstantiation consubstantiation transubstantiation and consubstantiation and, those words, yeah and all what, the other what ones we were wondering whether there was a term for the more baptisty understanding which is non-substantiation <laughs> yeah i have actually been googling non-substantiation and it's not a word apparently it's um, not a word it's not a word so yeah no nah, so there there is no, no word to find for the, uh, well, yeah, in, back at Moore College you, in seminary, we used to talk about affirming the real absence. <laughs> Probably <laughs> won't go down well in an well academic essay. No, <laughs> no, no as, as I mentioned to you, I think we were off air when I mentioned to you the Cash Chapel at Moore College. It, it, on on the, the, the Eucharistic table there, instead of the normal words, you know, do this in remembrance of me, or, or mm -hmm. the words were, he is not here. 
probably not the most faithful words. I don't know whether it's done. I mean, it not even he has risen there as well. Just, you know, it, it seemed to be affirming the real absence. Uh, it's what not something you want to see in a church, I wouldn't think. <laughs> he's not here. <laughs> That's, he's not here. Sorry. Go on. Sorry. Go the wrong place. <laughs> Go somewhere else. <laughs> Go somewhere else. <laughs> well, I'd like to think that God has been with us this morning. And uh, I've I've certainly sensed the presence of God with us this morning, oh, and uh, it's it's great to be out here at Benacrombi with my brother Scotty. I don't know if you want to poke your face in here at the last second, Scotty. You know, you'll just wave from a distance. That's all good. Uh, we'd love to have more people out here in the bush. I'll be here again next week, and um, you're all very welcome to join me. There's not so many online now that we'd be overwhelmed if you all came. I appreciate for some that may be more difficult than others. Um, either way, up, we'll, we'll meet. Sorry, brother. I just looked up where Binner Crombie actually is. It's just outside Canberra. Uh, it, we're a couple of hours from Canberra. Well, okay. It's the closest, the closest, um, the closest uh, city, uh, city is, is, um, Taralga. Oh, I thought it was Goulburn. Uh, it's, yes, it's, it's closer to Goulburn than if you're in Canberra, you come up via Goulburn. Yeah. Mm. And, um, and then you head northwest of Taralga. And then after that, it's about another, uh, well, it's 45 minutes on dirt roads. Wow. Which it's really out of the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Two river crossings. Yeah. The last, the last river crossing at the moment. You wouldn't want to go across it if you weren't in a four wheel drive. So it's, um, yeah, it's. Look, I think in some ways, you know, the the uh, remoteness of it is adds to the mystique. Yeah. You know, if you, if yeah, you have to sort of remote. swim across a crocodile infested river to get here, it'd be even better in some ways. But given we depend on having clients here, perhaps not. Yeah. <laughs> Either Somewhere way, you'd be very welcome to join me out here any time, brother. No, you know, the, the uh, way things are going lately, I may have to find places like yours. <laughs> well, look, this is what Scotty and I were talking about, you know, that, uh, you know, with all these wars and rumours of wars, you know, perhaps this will be the safest place to be. Yeah. yeah That's you know, sorry, a horrible some, thought, isn't it? I shouldn't smile yeah, as some, I say that, but um, yeah. there's room here. We'd love to have everybody. Well, yeah, it's a possibility. I mean, we are looking at establishing our own community out here, spiritual community. Indeed, I'm hoping that this year we will see what may well be the first ever Christian Muslim joint monastic community set up. Wow, okay. Well, yeah. I can lead Islamic services if you want. Sorry? I can lead Islamic services. Wow. Because yeah, I lived that's in impressive, a, yeah, so in India, I lived using all the Islamic uh, cultural practices. So I would go to the mosque, I would say the surah, uh, so I knew the surah off by heart, because there are quite a few of those surahs actually quite fit well with the scriptures, and um, yeah, so you can live as using the Islamic cultural uh, context. Uh, as a believer. Powerful, brother. Mm. Powerful. Mm. There's a guy right, called look, Phil I'm Parshall. I'm going to sign off now. Yep. Sorry, brother. There's a guy called Phil Parshell who wrote a whole lot of books on how believers could interact with, with Islamic people um, using their own culture. As you know, I wrote a book about it myself. Did you? <laughs> Really, I did. Sorry, I didn't I, know that. Did you copy it? No. Christians and Muslims can be friends. Come on, that was my last book. It was an Amazon <laughs> bestseller. Know, sorry. <laughs> well, sorry? We, we got lots to talk about then. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to send you a copy of the book, brother. Yeah. Anybody else want one, just let me know. Otherwise, Patricia, God bless you. It's good to have you with us. Ruby, Mariam, God bless you. It's good to have you have you with us. Pia, Karen, Lorraine, dear Lorraine, still want to have you out here in the bush with us, Lorraine. Um, Bronwyn, Joy, Karen, and anybody else who is uh, 
uh, still with us. God bless you. God go with you. We'll see you in the meeting room if you want to join us, fatherdave.net forward slash meet in a few minutes. Otherwise, till next week, God go with you.